So it goes to, to, to this, the, the way that we can affect our culture is number one is my transformed life is going to affect those who are around me. Number two, we pray and say, God, break my heart for what breaks your heart. And then look at it individually and look at it systemically. Welcome, 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 welcome to my Boulevard. All right, what's up? We are here with Pastor Derwin Gray. I am excited. You know, there's always, like all the guests that I have, I'm always excited about, but I absolutely love the man that we're going to be talking to today. Derwin is someone that I remember, we were just talking right before we jumped on that we were in a car. We planted around the same time. We were thinking around the same time of just about, okay, like asking the Lord to do mighty things through our ministries. And, and I know... God has done that. He has done some great things. And I have uh, been a fan, been a, 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 a co-laborer with this man. He is a, also a former football player. You know, it's always good talking to athletes. We just bring a different perspective to, to things, you know, uh, even to the faith when we come to athlete, as athletes, you know. So he gets me on so many levels. And so I love talking to this man uh, on about so many things and about so many different um, on so many different levels. But here he is, the man, the myth, the legend. What's happening, Derwin, Derwin Gray. How you doing, brother? Hey, I am doing really, really good. And uh, it's like we old heads now. I still remember us driving to Arkansas to that church planners conference. And um, the thing I distinctly remember about you is I was like, this guy is a movement maker. This guy is thinking not just about how to plant one church. He's thinking about how to create a movement of churches to have a, um, a deep gospel. When I mean deep gospel, I don't mean just a gospel that won't send you to hell. I mean a gospel that brings heaven to earth through the people who've been saved by the God of heaven by grace through faith. And so I've always appreciated uh, that about you. And uh, man, I'm just honored to be with you. I'm a big admirer of your ministry and the things that you're doing. And uh, I know the last several years have just been tough because whenever you mm -hmm. are uh, doing a Pauline ministry where it is unacceptable to go to the other, to go to the Gentile, um, there's a lot. And it reminds me of Acts chapter nine when Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and Jesus says, I'm gonna send you to the Gentiles. And you're going to need to know how much you're going to have to suffer for my namesake. Hmm. And when you do multi-ethnic ministry, you get shots from people that look like you and people who don't look like you. Because, frankly, it's easier to do a homogeneous ministry than to do a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic ministry rooted in God's covenant with Abraham. And so, brother, it's an honor to partner with you for, for all these years. Yeah, man. Well, I do appreciate that. And the same is true going the other way, man. You have been a, an inspiration now. You know, what's interesting about you talk about like our time, you know, and the going to the church planner conference, you talk about, you know, the, even the last few years, right, has been hard. We're in a time where people are leaving loud that if you are in multi-ethnic ministry, then you are an Uncle Tom, you're a sellout, you're all of that. And you're getting you're getting shots on all sides, both sides. You know, and, and it's hard, you know, and it's not to kind of create a woe is, woe is me or woe is us kind of moment. But sometimes you just feel like, man, if I could just get away and just get rid myself of this tension. Right. And yeah. and like you said, it just kind of just go or just pick a camp and this is right. So at least we can have that that sense. I mean, how do how do you wrestle with that that tension where. You, you feel like, man, it's like, all right, I see God giving us this ministry of reconciliation. I see what the, the scriptures, this robust gospel says that is to be applied to all people. But it just seems like so many, so often that's not our lived experience. How, yeah. how do you kind of maintain your health, your sanity in the midst of that? Yeah. So I'm going to give you some uh, a theological perspective that moves into a pastoral spiritual formation perspective. So from a theological perspective, uh, those people didn't save me. Those people don't mm -hmm. sanctify me and those people will not glorify me. There's only one who saved and called me and his name is King Jesus. So that allows me theologically that in my heart, 
I can do Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. There are times where it is mournful that there is deep, deep hurt. Um, but God is even gracious in that deep hurt. And then lastly, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for great is their reward in heaven. And Dahadi, what I have found over the last 15 years is people go from, man, what you're doing is wrong to, okay, let me look to what are you doing? How did you do it? Show me how to do, do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a, it's amazing how gospel centered, Jesus focused, multi-ethnic ministry is growing. And there are people leaving loud, but there are people coming in joyful. And mm -hmm. uh, I was just sharing with our team as we looked at our year in for 2023 it's amazing. We have nearly 13,000 people, multi-ethnic people that are involved in Transformation Church weekly. Uh, we celebrated making our one millionth meal this year. We uh, feed over 400 families a month through what's called the market, a free grocery store. And so, brother, we're just going to keep on in God's grace and asking him to give us tough minds and tender hearts, but more importantly, hands that are willing to serve. I love that. Tough mind and tender hearts. Because, it's, I mean, and that's hard because oftentimes in order for self-protection, you can be get, you can get, um, you know, tough minds, but also tough hearts because in it's self-preservation, it's self-protection. And which leads me to what I want to talk a little bit about is this, hey. the good life, the book, right? Yeah. And which is, a I love it because you talk about the pathway the pathway that we see in that that begins in the Sermon on the Mount, something that we talk about, the Beatitudes. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Like, how do you correlate kind of the, this idea of the good life, right, with these tough times, right, where you talk about this, the concept of, you know, tough mind, but also tender hearts. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. maintaining that balance. Absolutely. So, so. Um, the Beatitudes get overlooked so much. So when Jesus, God in human flesh, when he came, he preached, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? So he opens up the kingdom of God by teaching what is commonly called the Beatitudes. And it starts with blessed are those who are poor in spirit for there's a kingdom of heaven. Well, Jesus gives eight characteristics of someone that's blessed. And what's interesting is the Greek word for blessed that Jesus uses is the Greek word makros. And it literally means a state of happiness. So it could read, uh, like, for example, Matthew 5, 4, happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so the point that I'm trying to show is we have been created for happiness. But the happiness we've been created for is beyond good happenings happening to us. It is beyond situations and circumstances, and it is rooted in pleasure of God himself, that, that yeah. God himself is our joy. And so when I wrote The Good Life, it was like right when the pandemic was hit, hit right when the pandemic pandemic just descended upon us. It is a best selling book. It's by far my best selling book. And I think what caught people by surprise is they felt free to go, oh, you mean the job isn't going to make me happy the way I want. The spouse isn't going to make me happy the way I want. The stuff isn't going to make me happy the way I want. The disappointment isn't going to take my happiness away because here it is, true Happiness is not about always feeling good. It's about God making us good for the good of the world. And so when you read the Beatitudes, for example, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. So happy are people who make peace. Happy are people who exemplify the reconciling, rescuing love of King Jesus. So happiness is a disposition. Happiness is a state of being as heirs of Christ 
through the Holy Spirit's power to the glory of God. And I think people have gotten freed up, but not only freed up, the beauty of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, the genius of Jesus is in essence through the Beatitudes. He's saying, not only will you become happy, but you will become holy. And when you mm -hmm. become holy, you will become happy. And then Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine that you glorify your father in heaven. Well, what is that light? That light is the holy, happy life found in the Beatitudes. And it's not something that we curate ourselves. It's not something we craft ourselves. It is by invitation of grace only to participate in the very life of the triune God, where he forms us into people who are poor in spirit. That's dependent on God, where he forms us into people who are pure in heart. God makes us pure through his blood. And so uh, this book is a manifesto and it is a rebellion against our culture that says, well, you really can't be happy. And God is going, no, I actually saved you to be happy, but it's a greater happiness than just sentimental feelings or good things. It's a happiness that leads to holiness. Yeah, and I love that. And I love even the way how it's described, and you describe it as a pathway, right? It's like this, these are the path to that happiness. And it's not even the the de-emphasis solely on simply the destination. Because, you know, as so many of us, we want just like, just forget the path, give me the destination, <laughs> right? But like being able to see and wrestle with that tension. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you know, that that reminds me of, of this. My uh, my senior year in high school, we we're playing a second round of the uh, state championship in uh, San Antonio, Texas. I played at a high school called Converse Judson, and we we're playing the Alice Coyotes. And the Alice Coyotes ran a very complicated offense that required me as a safety to read my keys, right? If I read my keys, I could stop the play. But if I wasn't disciplined, I would blow the play. So at practice all week, our coaches had us run these plays. And as I was practicing the plays, every time I blew the play, not because I wasn't disciplined, but because the head coach was in the way. And so three times in a row, I blew the play because the head coach was in the way. And I come from an era where you don't disrespect your co coaches. You don't tell them to move. You just wait until he figures out that he's in the way. <laughs> and my defensive back coach was yelling at me the whole time. And I was angry inside. Right. So we get to the game. It's seven nothing at halftime. I mean, it, it it is close. Then the Alice Coyotes run that play that I practiced and blew because the coach is in the way. The first time they throw it, interception. The second time they throw it, interception. The third time they throw it, interception. So I'm San Antonio High School Player of the Week. And even to this day as a 52-year-old man, I still remember that game. But you know what? I don't remember the interceptions as much as I remember the pathway of practicing that difficulty to get the interceptions. And so God, in many ways, allows us to marinate and to cultivate. He is infinite. He is inexhaustible. He is unending. And so our delight of him, our joy of him, our transformation is a process. And so being in the process of God's grace is a wonderful and beautiful thing. And so often we have destination disease. And the problem is a lot of us get to a great destination, but we don't know it's great because we didn't realize that the great part of it was the journey of who you're actually journeying with. That's good. I love that idea. I mean, you said the the journey and who we're journeying with. And I think that that oftentimes that we want the fruit of the spirit, but we don't want the spirit, right? We And so a lot of times what we do is that we, we even, we'll even discipline ourselves. Like, I, I'm a discipline to love. I got to love more. I got to love more. So we'll gird our teeth and we put on what we talk about here is like the hard hat identity, right? I'm going to, I'm going to love more. I'm going to be more peaceful. I'm going to be you know, more patient, right? And but we don't understand that the the journey with the spirit, abiding in the spirit, I think is so critical. You yeah, know, in that in that process. Well, you well, know. well, well, you know, and um, and I get I get I get really passionate about this point. Is 
I think we have a lot of Christless Christianity in the United States mm -hmm. of America. We have a lot of gospelless churches. And what I mean by, by that is we teach morals and principles. And then what it does is it feeds our flesh and we turn into spiritual narcissists, meaning mm -hmm. I'm going to get better. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you know what that creates? That creates Pharisees or that creates people who hide their sin and who self loathe. There is nothing greater than God's grace to motivate obedience. Think of Romans 12, 1, where the apostle Paul tells the multi-ethnic churches in Romans, he basically says this, he says, brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy, the mercy is the sinless life of Christ, the atoning sacrificial death of Jesus, his justification, his reconciliation, his, his just the beauty of his blood and his forgiveness. In view of his mercy, present your bodies as a holy living sacrifice. This is your reasonable act of worship. So we worship, which is obedience, not because we try harder, is because we, view, oh my God, is because we view the magnificence of Jesus's mercy. We don't have enough preaching that moves people to delight in Jesus. If a man yeah. or a woman is captivated by Jesus, obedience will follow. So, Duran, how do you, like, as people take responsibility? Because, you know, we named My Boulevard My Boulevard because it is us rejecting passivity and accepting responsibility of where we live, where we work and where we worship. And a lot of people who are, you know, that are part of my boulevard and, you know, will listen into this are, they says, yes, okay, I get that for me and I want to continue to cultivate that, but how do I help others? Like if I'm pastoring a church, if I'm pastoring my team, if I'm, you know, leading my family, right? How do we help to cultivate the good life in others, you know, in that way, the way that you're referring to. Yeah, man. So what I would say is this by way of illustration, um, you know how people are just excited about their iPhones and their MacBooks. I mean, they just try to convert everybody to jobs. The father, you must be a PC guy. Uh, absolutely. 100%. I'm Microsoft, see, Samsung, Galaxy. We, we were off to a good start. We were doing well. And then, you know, you have to throw, see, it's the PC people who always want to throw in like those slight jabs all the time. I so, mean, see, so. I was I was actually attempting to give a compliment because <laughs> okay, okay. your products Continue. are so well, work so well, people delight in them and they want others to delight in them. Imagine if God's people, because they were getting a steady diet of gospel, would delight and treasure and adore Jesus because the sinless one took upon our sin. The righteous one took upon our unrighteousness and gave us his righteousness. Imagine if we understood the great exchange, my death for his life, my unholiness for his holiness, my lack of beauty for his beauty. And imagine if that's so cultivated in us that we became everyday missionaries. And a part of being a missionary is not only proclaiming the gospel, but seeing hurts and saying, how can I be healing. So it goes to, to, to this, the, the way that we can affect our culture is number one is my transformed life is going to affect those who are around me. Number two, we pray and say, God, break my heart for what breaks your heart. And then look at it individually and look at it systemically. So here at, at Transformation Church, when we first came here um, 14 years ago, we, we said, what's the biggest way we can make an impact? It's the public schools. And so we started just serving public schools. We don't want anything. We just want to serve you. So now we've got about 10 public schools. We provide uh, meals. We provide tutoring. We provided computers. That's turned into a market where we feed people. And so like it's, it begins with God, start a revival, draw a circle and say, start with the person in this circle. And many hands make light work. That's really good. I love that. 
I love that. And I just love how it's just being faithful for to what God has in front of you and then allowing him to enlarge your 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 borders, your territories, as the old good prayer Jabez uh, <laughs> has told us. I uh, hope our books be. sell as good as that one. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey, after this, we, it is. It's going. It's going to just take off even more, right? Take off. Yes, yes. So, so what? How to those people that get so fixated, right? And I think that that sometimes with the pain, right? Paul talks about it in Galatians. He says, like these people are preaching a different gospel. But not only are they preaching a different gospel, they're preaching a, just a, a gospel later on. It talks about that's appealing to your flesh, right? And, it, you know, and, 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 and oftentimes when I think about that, the, the appealing to the flesh is that you're talking to a people who have been oppressed by Rome and been, been an oppressed people for so many. And when you're talking to an oppressed people to want to take the gospel to your oppressors, it's like it, it'll, it'll appeal more to my flesh if I can hate them right, or disregard them than to include them. And yeah. so they were they were buried in their pain and they couldn't get fixated outside of their pain. Yeah. I guess my question is this, that in a time, right, there's so much pain, so much trauma, so much stuff that's going on right now, uh, so much tension that, that is taking place. How do you help people get beyond their pain to see that this good life, the invitation of the good life? Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, I think the first thing is we all have to be real about pain, R regardless of your ethnicity or social economic class. We all have something in common. We live in a fallen world and the shrapnel of that fallen world has brought pain to us, whether if it's abuse, whether if it's oppression, whether if it's um, I mean, it's just so, so much. Right. And the only way you can get people's eyes off of their own pain is to move their eyes upward to the cross and to look at the pain of King Jesus. And, mm -hmm. and so life is going to be painful. It's either going to be pain that destructs or it's going to be pain that instructs us in the gospel. And Philippians 2, as Paul is speaking to the multi-ethnic churches in Philippi, he says in Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but consider others better than yourselves. Look only, not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. You have the mind of Christ, although he existed in the form of God, did not uh, equate, did not grasp equality with God, something to be grasped, but obediently humbled himself as a servant, death on a cross, right? So the way we get people's eyes off themselves is to get their eyes on Jesus. And no matter how much we have suffered, it is infinitesimal to the suffering of Jesus because Jesus took all of our collective suffering for all time and all history. And in one place, it all accumulated in his flesh on the cross 2,000 years ago. So pain is a part of what it means to follow Christ. It's a life of cruciformity. And out of that pain, Jesus births gospel purpose. He births mission. He births empathy. Um, me not growing up with a dad has mm -hmm. birthed within me the idea and the hope and the heart to be a great dad. The first wedding I went to was my own at 21. Out of that pain, God has birthed a desire to be a husband. And my kids are 27 and 23 now, and I've been married almost 32 years. And, and so pain in the potter's hands creates purpose, but we've got to get people's eyes off of themselves I can't do that. I can preach about it, but they've got to respond to the Holy Spirit. And the, the Heidi, one, one of the things I will say, and I don't want to dis, dismiss anybody's pain or my pain, but we live in an era where it almost pays to stay a perpetual victim. Hmm. It, it's it's like an era of, well, everybody done this to me. Everybody done this to me. And people traumatize me. Um, it's safe to say that no one has hurt Derwin Gray more than Derwin Gray. Yeah. And that's the and reason so, why I oftentimes I, I think about what you're saying. And I and I, I like to say it's like we 
oftentimes refer to the first Adam instead of the second Adam. The first Adam was like, it's the woman you gave me. It's the yeah. father you gave me. It's the life you gave me. It's the childhood you gave me. It's the like and everything now is out externally. There's no longer kind of an ownership. But, you know, what mm -hmm. the second Adam is that he, what he, instead of saying it's the outside, it's the everything that you gave me, he is willing down to lay down his life. And, you know, and that's that word, the passion. Right. I like that. De I define passion as a willingness to endure the pain for something that's greater than the pain. And I yeah. think that it's oftentimes it's important for us to understand that there is no place called away. There is no we, there's nowhere we can go to get away from the pain, but we have to live with passion. And that's why I love the passion verses like when Jesus says, I must go to Jerusalem. I must yeah. do these things. And then you also see the idea of like and even going back to the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Those words are passion words. Satisfied. Yeah. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Those are those are passion words. Those are people who are willing to endure. Like they're gonna, they're willing to endure their hunger. They're willing to endure their thirst for something that they may not ever get satiated on this side of heaven. Yeah. And and what's beautiful is the word righteousness can be translated as justice. And justice is when God's love goes public for the good of others. And so we are satisfied as we pour out our lives for the good of others in the gospel. That's both in deed and in proclamation. God has rigged the game that happiness is attached to him. Um, trying to have happiness outside of God in Christ is like trying to fly to the moon by jumping. Ain't gonna mm -hmm. happen. That's good. That's good. All right. We were, before I let you go, I, would, I just want to know like, what could the people expect from the Derwin Gray Ministries coming up? You know, the transformation. Like, what, 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 what can we expect in the in the yeah. future? Yeah, man. So we are uh, we're in the process of having uh, four campuses in the next ten years, and so uh, we're going to launch uh, Transformation Church Lake Wiley, about thir thir thirty minutes from where we are here in Indianland, South Carolina. Lina. Um, also, I'll have a new book coming out in the spring of 2025 called Lit Up With Love, Becoming Good News People in a Gospel-Starved World. I'm so excited about that book because I want to light up pastors and congregations with the love of Christ to be on mission with Christ. Um, so yeah, man. And other than that, most importantly, I want to be a faithful husband. I want to be a great dad and I want to be a godly man. Uh, the, the greatest gift that I can give Transformation Church is to be a man of, of great holiness. Man, amen. Well, I really do appreciate you, man. Appreciate your ministry. Appreciate your faithfulness. And when I, most of all, I appreciate you being a man who's dependent on the Spirit, using the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And you have never um, lacked in that area and, you know, and using the spirit's favorite, favorite, favorite weapon. And so, man, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your passion, you know, and, um, and thank you for your ministry, man. Same bro. Appreciate you, doc. Appreciate you. All right. Again, reject passivity, accept responsibility, take responsibility of where you live, where you work and where, where you worship. My heart and my prayer is that we can all take responsibility of where we live, work, and worship and say, this is my boulevard. Until next time, we'll see you guys. Grace and peace. <laughs>